If you record your voice, let's say in your home studio, you have an idea of what you want it to sound like. Well, in this video, I'm going to play for you um, what I think is one of the best uh, voice recording submissions that I've ever received. It sounds so good, and it's because of proper acoustic treatment that is in this person's studio. Uh, I'm gonna play for you what that sounds like. I'm gonna explain to you why it sounds so good, why you should strive for this sound, and then we'll talk about how to achieve it. How's it going? I'm Lenny B, voiceover audio engineer, and my job is to help voiceover um, artists and voiceover talent and creators make a better connection with their audience, with people listening to their uh, their work, uh, people watching their videos, and, and that's just what I do. I, um, I do a lot of things, uh, and one of them is create custom processing presets um, in DAWs, digital audio workstations, so using EQ and compression. Um, but no matter what uh, type of voiceover artist you are, even if you're working on projects for yourself, uh, it could be podcasting, it could be video games, it could be narration, audiobooks, commercial voiceover, um, those are the people that I work with. And I wanted to show you a particular submission that I got um, just recently. And, and when I say submission, um, you know, you can, if you want to, send me your audio file. And what I do, uh, one of the services that I offer is I'll send you a free example of what your or voice recording can sound like with my processing. And I'll show you what I mean. Um, one of the uh, submissions that I got was from a voiceover artist uh, from Phoenix, Arizona. And the reason why I want to bring this to your attention is because this might possibly be one of the best recorded submissions that I have received. And when I say best recorded, I'm talking about the quality of the audio recording. The raw file sounds amazing. And I think this is important because um, uh, one of the things that is, I think, one of the biggest challenges for voiceover artists, especially if you're recording in your home studio, um, acoustic treatment is a big hurdle. Um, I've just released a, a course. It's called Acoustic treatment for voiceover. This course breaks down the type of treatments you need, uh, the quantity of treatments you're going to need, where to place it, and it really talks about how voice travels in a recording space. And once you understand all these things, um, not only can you improve the sound of your voice recording with the acoustic treatment that you may already have, but if you're looking to upgrade or if you're looking to um, just kind of get to that next level, you want to maybe upgrade uh, to a more professional uh, type of acoustic treatment, you'll know exactly what to look for. You'll know exactly what you need to get. Um, and the reason why, you know, this is one of my newer courses and I've just recently released it is because it's one of the big, um, it's one of the big challenges. It's one of the big things that uh, is really difficult for people to understand. And uh, I think my main effort uh, with this course was the worst thing that can happen is if you buy a bunch of acoustic treatment and you still have the problem after you not only invested all that money, but you know you put in the time and effort and then you're excited about getting a good result and it still isn't um, giving you the sound that you want. That's a bummer. So um, I really... Uh, I really think you're going to find value out of this course. So let's look at uh, this submission. It's from um, Daniel Coet is his name. And I'm going to play you uh, this file. And it's just the raw recording. I'm going to take off all the processing that I've done. And what I want you to hear is um, how well the recording sounds, how balanced it sounds in the room without any effects. This is just in his booth, but he has proper acoustic treatment. And we'll discuss this, what it is and why. And, and uh, first I want you to hear the raw file and then I'm going to point your ears to something um, specific to listen to. Let's listen to what he's got so far. This is the raw audio, no processing uh, from Daniel Coet. My name is Daniel Coet, and I'm a voice actor based in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm recording this audio using my Sennheiser MKH416, running it through my Rode Rodecaster Pro 2 interface, and uh, I'm recording from my custom-built 4x4 booth. I've got six inches of insulation on every surface, whether it be the ceiling, the walls, the door. My plan has been for the longest time to get just nice, clean, raw audio, but I do really want to see what a good EQ curve could do to really just bring out a little bit more of that. You know what I mean? Anyway, I I've seen your videos uh, for a while now, and I've, I've enjoyed them a lot, but I've never really 
pushed myself to actually submit. And I figured, you know what, this weekend, why not? So I went ahead, recorded this audio for you, and I can't wait to see what you've got in store for me. Thanks, Lenny. Well, Daniel, I'm, I'm really glad you did send in the submission. Uh, and Daniel, um, since he sent this, has become a client. He purchased the processing preset that I sent uh, to him and he heard the example of it. I'm going to play that for you so you can hear the difference. But what I want to do now is kind of, um, you know, we heard the, the, the whole submission. I actually cut a few things out that weren't pertinent to this conversation. But um, I wanted you to hear his entire sentiment and him describing what he's done in his studio. Uh, um and we'll talk about the equipment that he's using as well, but I want to point your ears to something. So when you listen to this raw recording, because he has the right type, the right quantity, and the right placement of his acoustic treatment in his recording space, which is a small booth actually, uh, there are no reflections in this recording. That's what gives it the professional sound. And um, I repeat this throughout the acoustic treatment for voiceover training course. A professional sounding recording is void of reflections. It's reflectionless in all frequency spaces. That means high frequency reflections, mid frequency reflections, and low frequency reflections. And this is the thing that stumps a lot of people. And this is what we talk about in the course. And you really get an understanding of what you need uh, after you go through this course. But um, a lot of times when people use the wrong type of acoustic treatment or not enough acoustic treatment or they don't put it in the right place in their recording space, from the microphone's perspective, the microphone can still pick up reflections. What happens often is high frequencies and mid frequencies are absorbed by the acoustic treatment, but the low frequencies go back into the microphone at a slight delay and it blurs the audio. It requires me to use EQ to fix imbalances in particular frequency spaces. So uh, here's what I want to do. Let me play for you now this audio file again, and I'm going to um, have the uh, processing disengaged, and then I'm going to engage the processing preset that I've created for Daniel so you can hear the difference. Um, and then we'll discuss what actually what I've done. But uh, let's listen to the audio clip again, first with the processing disengaged and then I'll put it in. My name is Daniel Coet and I'm a voice actor based in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm recording this audio using my Sennheiser MKH416, running it through my Rode Rodecaster Pro 2 interface, and uh, I'm recording from my custom built 4x4 booth. I've got six inches of insulation on every surface, whether it be the ceiling, the walls, the door, you can hear that the processing brings the uh, recording closer. I think when people, um, they use the word present, uh, it sounds like the, the voice is physically sounds like it's closer to your face. And I believe um, that the processing could do that with compression or a little bit of EQ to balance uh, things even further. Now, uh, with that said, let me show you what, um, I'm going to show you what the EQ looks like on his uh, processing here. Um, okay. Now, I talked about when you have a properly treated, with acoustic treatment, a properly treated uh, recording space, it balances out the frequencies. And we've done that. Um, I definitely feel like there is no reflections or extremely little when I hear his raw recording. You know, naturally, certain people have uh, maybe a resonance in their chest cavity and certain parts of people's voices maybe uh, uh, certain frequencies may be a little louder than others. That's natural. And I'd much, um, well, well, I, you know, when you capture a recording to modify those imbalances that are coming from your pure voice, that's separate from having to use EQ to modify imbalances that are coming from the room, reflections that are bouncing off the walls and then back into the microphone at a slight delay. Those are different type of imbalances. This is the best case scenario where I'm able to um, look at his recording and and uh, you can see that they're in 283 hertz and in 464 hertz. In these two areas, he's got a naturally bassy type of sound in his voice uh, for his recording. Uh, it also has to do with the mic that you're using. Uh, it also has to do with... Um, uh, the pickup pattern of the microphone and, and your voice. Uh, also, uh, in the upper mid-range, uh, 2300 and about 36 and a half, uh, 100 uh, hertz, 
he has another naturally occurring uh, imbalance in those frequencies. They're a little higher, um, and that has to do with these higher frequencies. I think that has to do with the shape of your nasal cavity, uh, the way your um, vocal cords are in your throat. I mean, everybody's different, and his voice on this microphone uh, has a little bit of an imbalance in those frequencies, and we're able to shape that with the EQ. But I just want to point out and explain to you that th that imbalance is a different type of imbalance than using EQ to fix something that is happening uh, wrong in the room. Um, it's, you know, what I'm doing, I'm just shaping his pure voice. And those are the differences that you're hearing with the EQ. And what I'm going to do for you now is let's play it. Here's the raw audio with no EQ first, and then I'll engage the equalizer so you can hear what the F6 sounds like. My name is Daniel Coet, and I'm a voice actor based in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm recording this audio using my Sennheiser MKH416, running it through my Rode Rodecaster Pro 2 interface. I think you can hear that I, I've taken a little bit of energy away from the low uh, bassy sound in his voice, and then a little bit of that mid-range, that pokey kind of uh, upper mid-range in his voice. I've just kind of tamped that down just a little bit to give it a nice, pleasing sound. Now, you know, the EQ gives me uh, the tools that I need to find those frequencies, but I'm also using my ears and, and listening. And, you know, if, if this is not this is one of my strengths, I'm good at hearing uh, frequency spaces and I've been doing this for such a long time. So don't be discouraged if you try to do this and you can't quite find it. I mean, it's a skill. It's a muscle that you have to um, to work out and use constantly and get better and get better at it. Uh, but I will also say uh, the F6, the Waves F6 EQ that I use, it, it uh, it's a great tool because it helps me find those spaces. And I'll give you an example. I'm going to play it again and you can solo certain frequency spaces too. My name is Daniel Coet, and I'm a voice actor based in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm recording this audio using my Sennheiser MKH-46. So when I right click on these frequency bands, it solos them for me and I can move them around and, and find the sound that I'm looking for. And then I'm able to attenuate that frequency space to balance it out and use my ears. After I make the changes that I need to with the EQ, and I've done that, removing energy in the low frequency space, removing some energy in this upper mid frequency space, I um, replenish that energy uh, by adding 3 dB out, going out of the EQ. So I've taken away this energy and I put it back on the overall output. So when I disengage uh, and, and engage the EQ, you're hearing just the EQ changes. You're hearing not very much of a volume change. I don't want to uh, have a volume change. I want just those EQ frequencies to be balanced again. And because I'm removing that energy, I replenish it again on the output. That's called gain staging. And it's important to do that after uh, every processing change that you make. And I do that uh, quite often. And one of the things uh, that helps me make sure that I'm gain staging correctly is I use these two meters. Often they're the Ulean meter. They're loudness meters, but they also give me uh, true peak uh, uh, and peak information. So uh, I get an average with the LUFS and I'm also looking at the peaks. While I'm processing, I'll, I'll use this. So I'll show you real quick. Uh, I will disengage the EQ and you'll see that the peak is very, very similar. Uh, and the uh, integrated loudness and the light gray boxes here, you'll see these are very similar. This is before, the one on the left is before the uh, processing. My whole goal here is to try to keep them similar before and after the processing. So let's look, uh, EQ disengaged. My name is Daniel Coet, and I'm a voice actor based in Phoenix, Arizona. Obviously they're the same because Nothing has changed. Uh, the uh, EQ is disengaged. Now I'll EQ it and you'll see it's not going to be exactly the same, but it'll be very, very similar. My name is Daniel Coet, and I'm a voice actor based in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm recording this audio using my Sennheiser MKH416, running it through my Rode Rodecaster Pro 2 interface. And uh, I'm recording from my custom-built 4x4 booth. I've got six inches of insulation on every surface, whether it be the ceiling, yeah, you can see that they uh, they stay pretty similar, and that's the goal here. Um, I will say that when I do just general EQing, when I do what I need to do to EQ a voice, there's usually 2 to 3 dB. In some cases, it'll be more, but um, if I have to EQ uh, a certain way to balance out a recording, um, if I have to replenish more than 3 there's usually something else going on. There's usually some other type of problem, but generally two to three dB 
uh, I will remove and then I replenish it uh, in the output to gain stage the EQ. All right, the next um, processing plugin we go in here as usual is the Shep's Omni channel one of my favorites I always say this um, if you're familiar with the channel you see this all the time because this um, this plugin has everything you need to process a voice and and more actually let's talk about it let me play um, the changes I'm gonna have the voice playing I'll have the EQ engaged and then I'm gonna add the Shep's Omni channel so you can hear what the difference is that is just being added with the Shep's Omni channel, and then we'll discuss exactly what's happening in this recording. My name is Daniel Coet, and I'm a voice actor based in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm recording this audio using my Sennheiser MKH416, running it through my Rode Rodecaster Pro 2 interface, and uh, I'm recording from my custom-built 4x4 booth. I've got six inches of insulation on every surface, whether it be the ceiling, the walls, the door. My plan has been for the longest time to get just nice clean raw audio you can hear that the recording just it just thickens up it widens out it just um it becomes more full and pleasing and um that's really uh, a combination of a lot of things and we'll talk about it there's a little bit of saturation going on usually 15 to 18 percent i've got 18.3 here of even saturation uh is what i'm adding uh, the latest version of the Shep's Omnichannel plugin was what we're looking at here. Uh, has a new resonance section. I'm not using any of that here. Uh, I am using the gate. And by the way, this is the order. It starts from the left to the right. So I add saturation first after the um, F6 EQ that we just looked at. Then I use a gate. And then uh, this has two de-essers. Actually, I'm sorry. I use an expander, not a gate. An expander, um, the end result is a little bit more of a gentle change. So you don't notice it. It's very transparent. A gate kind of uh, opens and closes kind of quickly and can be abrupt in certain situations. So I, I tend to lean toward the expander. The Shep's Omni Channel has a de section. Uh, and by the way, you can move these around. You could put the de in front of the gate and you can do that with all of, uh, of these processors. That's why it's so great. Um, I really think it has every tool that you need. Two de I'm using just one and we are de the frequencies from uh, starting at about uh, 5200 hertz up. So um, it's the high stuff and I'm probably taking usually three, maybe six at some loud sections of those higher frequencies are being, um, they're being attenuated only when they happen. That's what a de is doing. Uh, and then in the EQ section, I love the mid and the high EQ section. These curves, this particular EQ in the Shep's Omni channel sounds so good, I think, on voice. Um, you'll notice that the F6 is, is doing some um, subtractive EQ. We are removing energy. And then in the Shep's Omni channel, we are adding. So in the Shep's Omni channel, in the highs, uh, 10,000 hertz and above, that's really the air. I'm adding almost 2 dB. I'm using a broad curve uh, in the just on uh, just above 1K. This is really uh, that mid range tone. I'm using a real broad curve to punch that up uh, just over 2 dB. So these are just small changes. But this is additive EQ here in the highs and the mids. In the tone section around 300, where it can tend to get muddy sometimes, I am reducing just 1.5. I've got kind of a medium size uh, curve here, it's not all that big. And then um, in the original version that I sent uh, Daniel, I had a little bit of low energy pumped up, uh, but he requested that I modify it just a little bit, and I'm happy to do that. I always want to give my clients exactly the sound that they're looking for. So the second version, I um, took off that low again, and, uh, and I'm going to send him both. So he'll have two uh, uh, versions to work with. One has more of a lower sound and one less, and he can use them as he chooses for whatever project he's working on and what he thinks would work best with the project project. Um, so that's what we did uh, in the EQ section. Four different types of compressors are offered in the Shep's Omni channel. It used to be three, but in this latest version, they added a soft um, type of compressor, which is, it has more of a, um, a soft knee. Uh, I'm not using it here. I'm using the VCA compressor, which is a very transparent compressor, uh, an extremely low ratio, um, medium to fast attack, a fast release. This is really just taking off the high um, transients, the very highest parts 
uh, when we're talking about volume uh, and energy in his voice, it's just removing those and evening them out. And then the Shep Somni channel, one of the, another reason why it's so cool is you can add another um, a processor in here, an insert. And I'm deciding to use a second compressor, but you can use um, any one of the previous uh, processors. You can add that in, or you can add um, any... A plugin, a VST plugin that you have, you can actually add in um, the Shep Somni channel here. I am using a second compressor. We're using the Opto style or flavor, which is a really kind of soft, um, liquidy, kind of fluid, warm um, compressor and not using much. 3.5, but a very slow attack and a very, uh, I'd say it was more of a medium release, but I'm not getting very much um, reduction here. I think the end result of using a compressor in this way, the Opto compressor, is it just keeps things very consistent, I believe. And and also the Opto compressors have a little bit of a warmth that they add and uh, an even more of a presence. And then I'm adding just a touch of limiting, um, just making sure nothing goes over negative six. But as you saw in the recording and when I'm doing the gain staging, which I do on a consistent basis going through all of these uh, processors, Nothing is really over negative six, so this is just the the errant, uh, uh, excessive, unexpected, um, transient peak that pops through. It's just really housekeeping to keep it under wraps. One more thing I just want to mention, in this first compressor, I'm using a high-pass filter. So I'm only, in this VCA compressor, in this first compressor, I'm only compressing the frequencies above 261 hertz. Consider there's very little compression going on with this compressor in, in, in the Shep's Omni channel. But uh, what that does is just allows the, that low energy to come through the compressor. It never gets pushed down by the compressor. It keeps that warmth happening in the voice, which is one of the things I want to um, um, save and preserve in, when you add processing. Sometimes uh, adding a compressor without a high pass filter, uh, you'll hear the compressor work more. And I, I want it to be very transparent and it does that. Uh, and that um, high pass filter in the compressor, the side chain helps um, continue to retain that warmth through the compression. Before we go ahead and listen to the before and after um, this recording with the processing that I've put together for Daniel, I want to mention a couple things. Um, the acoustic treatment uh, for voiceover course is available. I'm going to put the um, uh, I'll put the link in the description. Uh, it is available now on the website, and I think if you are considering upgrading your room treatment. Or if you feel like, gosh, there's just something wrong, I can't seem to EQ it properly, or you just, I, I've, it's been a question mark for a long time. I've seen a lot of things online, I've read a lot of articles, but I just really don't understand why I'm not getting the sound that I'm searching for. This acoustic treatment co course is going to really answer those questions for you. Also, I don't want you to hesitate. If you are thinking about sending me your voice, a lot of people, uh, and this happens all the time, they're like, uh, I'm not going to send it to Lenny. I hear some of the quality he's working with and it's so good and my stuff is just I'm not at that level yet that's actually the type of file and recording that I think I can help with the most um, I don't want you to be shy don't be embarrassed I will never criticize I'm gonna say ah here's what you need to do your recording level is off you need to fix this or I'm gonna say hey um, you know this acoustic treatment uh, course can really help you you should check this out because I'm really hearing some reflections in the low or mid frequency space uh, in your room it's gonna help you no matter what, I'm going to make suggestions that will make an improvement. And if your recording is up to par or it's good enough to where uh, the processing can help, I will send you back a free example of what my processing sounds like on your recording, just so you can hear um, what it could be like. And uh, if it's something that you are interested in, in getting for your computer, we could work that out too. So um, don't be shy. I'll have the link uh, to where you submit your voice. You just fill out a quick form and then uh, I send you instructions on, hey, this is how I need the file. It's got to be a WAV file. Um, you know, between 30 seconds, and two minutes, and just all the uh, parameters that I need so I could do the best job for you. Okay, let's listen now to the fully processed audio uh, again uh, from Daniel in this really just well-treated room. It's got such a great sound raw, and then now you'll hear the before and after uh, with the processing that I've put together for him. First, the unprocessed, and then I'll engage the F6 um, uh, floating band dynamic EQ in that Shep Somni channel, uh, the two plugins that I decided to use uh, to create his custom sound. 
My name is Daniel Coet, and I'm a voice actor based in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm recording this audio using my Sennheiser MKH416, running it through my Rode Rodecaster Pro 2 interface, and uh, I'm recording from my custom-built 4x4 booth. I've got six inches of insulation on every surface, whether it be the ceiling, the walls, the door. My plan has been for the longest time to get just nice, clean, raw audio, but... I do really want to see what a good EQ curve could do to really just bring out a little bit more of that. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean, Daniel. I really am glad that uh, you decided to reach out and send me your audio file. I'll tell you this too. Is processed audio the right move for all auditions or all demos? No. I, I, I actually think uh, you need to kind of think about um, what type of audio or ask your client or ask a potential client what type of audio they want or do some research and find out, you know, certain situations are going to call for different types of audio. But when you need processed audio, uh, that's one of the things that I can help you with. And um, I think, you know, understanding how much acoustic treatment plays into the overall quality of, of raw and processed files um, you realize uh, that it's one of the priorities I think you should give your studio and uh, and you can learn all about it in that course. If you've got any questions about any of this stuff, please reach out. I love uh, responding to the questions in the comments and it also is, um, it ends up being a good uh, springboard for other videos that I do or even other courses that I do. The conversations really kind of help me help you. So uh, by all means, ask me those questions and send in your submission uh, if you're interested. I'm Lenny B, voiceover audio engineer. Thanks for watching.